We decided that we would not go to the plane voluntarily. We wanted to assert our legal rights. We knew our lawyers would be working for us on the outside. But they began to take people by force. They're, they managed to convince the last four women, uh, myself, Eva, from this group, you know, uh, Teresa, the great woman, to get on the plane because they kept beating the Irish man in front of us. And we eventually came to an agreement that we would, we would not agree to be deported and we would not sign uh, that we were agreeing to the deportation because it was illegal, but that we could stop resisting going to the plane if they let the Irishman go and if they let him on the plane with us. And, and so we got to the plane, but not before seeing, I think the most inhumane thing that I had seen through all of it, because I said the military violence stands as a fact in my mind about it. I think I isolate that as the, military as the military operation. What upsets me is the unnecessary abuse and humiliation and degradation and hatred that they treated us with after that. We saw the injured Turkish men who had been in hospital get into the plane. Now at this point it was Wednesday evening. Most of the men would be taken in the early hours of Monday. Most of the men were still dressed in what they'd been wearing when they went to bed on Sunday night because we hadn't been allowed to keep our luggage and they didn't give us a change of clothes. These men were in their, these were the injured men, they were in their bloodstained clothes. Many of them had um, sleeves and legs cut away, they'd been cut away to treat their uh, injuries in the emergency. One of the men was still receiving a blood transfusion and he was made, with the line in his arm, he was made to walk with the blood bag in his hand to the plane. Not even giving a wheelchair any kind of assistance, he was walking, carrying his own blood transfusion. And I saw about a dozen of the men hobbling with bandaged feet. I wanted to ask them why so many of them had been injured in, in their feet, what had happened. But I couldn't ask them because any time they spoke to us, they were beaten for speaking. I later found out that the injuries in the top of the feet were from when the helicopter came down and attacked the Marmara and the soldiers came down and they were shooting downwards either from the helicopter all the soldiers were shooting onto the lower decks. They were being shot at from above. You'll know that some of the, some of the dead were shot in the head. Other men were shot in the tops of the feet because they were being shot from above. So these men had been shot in the tops of the feet and they were still in the same clothes that they'd been in for three days, hobbling to the airplane. Not one of them had been given a wheelchair. Not one of them had been given crutches. When any of us, the, the detained men or the women, approached them and offered an arm to help them, support them in walking to the aeroplane, the Israeli soldiers came over, screamed at that person, smacked them and dragged them away, and they made all of these injured men who had been shot in the feet hobble all the way across the airport terminal, unaided, to the aeroplane. Absolutely no need for that. It was just pure contempt abuse and humiliation. And these soldiers sat and laughed and jeered and enjoyed watching it. I've never... I lived in Palestine for a long time. I, I lived in, in Balata in the refugee camp, the biggest refugee camp in the West Bank. I, I lived there in the Intifada. I've seen a lot of death, but I've never seen such contempt and humiliation. When we got to the plane, uh, it was nearly midnight. And we got there and found some of my colleagues who had left the prison at five o'clock in the morning were there waiting. We'd been kept for, my, my group, because we were the last group, we'd been kept for over 12 hours. The women who'd left voluntarily at five, the prison, had left the prison voluntarily at five o'clock in the morning had only been put on the aeroplane and they were all still sitting there waiting to depart. And that's the other thing that, uh, that I, I, I keep recalling. I think smell is the said strongest, most strongly linked to memory. And at that point, people have been sitting on the plane 14 hours in the clothes that they've been wearing for three days. Clothes with three day old, bright blood, fresh blood from wounds still bleeding and soaked with the kind of noxious adrenaline sweat that humans only produce when they're under sincere fear for their lives. And that smell on that plane was pretty overpowering. And the insults didn't stop there. We had three planes on the tarmac that the, the Turkish had sent to evacuate their people and 
the Israelis had chosen to put all of us on. The planes were not allowed by the control tower to use the radio. Absolutely unnecessary use again. The crew were having to use their mobile phones to contact the other planes sitting on the tarmac in Tel Aviv. The final lie, the final little insult was that the Israelis told us that all our possessions bar our electronics, all our possessions had been loaded onto the aeroplanes and would be there in Istanbul. Of course they weren't. It was an absolute lie. They had put a few random bags from the Marmara onto the planes, mostly empty, <laughs> insultingly. Some of them had been soiled, some of them had been urinated on. They'd all been looted, cash had been taken and everybody's electronics had been taken. But really only a, a, few, a few empty bags and a few items of clothing from the, mar from the Marmara were returned. 